UFOs, Martians, Green or Gray, Aliens, Area 51, Conspiracy Theories, Abductions, Science Fiction, the operative word there being fiction. But are there any actual truths to any of it? And if so, what does that tell us about our world, our lives, our beliefs, and our truths? We have the man with us tonight to talk about UFOs and the top secret truths and myths. Cognitive dissonance be damned. We are hunting for solutions because this is beyond the problems. If you give us one hour, we may give you a new perspective on life. Dr. Avi Loeb is an astrophysicist, a Harvard science professor, and a best-selling author. If there are any actual scientific projects or scientific studies that involve extraterrestrial beings or interstellar space, then there's a very good chance Avi Loeb is on that team. Dr. Loeb is the co-founder of the Galileo Project, a research program at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for astrophysics, dedicated to the scientific search for alien technology. Dr. Avi Loeb, thank you so much for coming on tonight. Thanks for having me. It's a great pleasure. You make headlines pretty much everywhere you go. In 2014, a meteorite crashed into the Pacific Ocean, and you found it. How in the world, no pun intended, did you find that? Well, this uh, particular meteor was uh, unusual in two ways. One, it was moving very fast, uh, faster than needed to escape from the gravitational pull of the sun. And that meant that it came from interstellar space. The U.S. Uh, Space Command confirmed that at the 99.999% confidence. And so uh, they also released the light curve uh, when this object, half a meter in size, collided with Earth uh, and exploded. Uh, and uh, from that, we concluded that it was tougher than all the space rocks that were identified by NASA over the past decade, 272 of them. And we also calculated that it was moving faster than 95% of the stars near the sun at 60 kilometers per second. And so that raised the possibility that maybe it's a Voyager-like meteor. Imagine our own probe colliding with another planet like the Earth sometime in the future, it would appear as a meteor in the sky of that planet, and uh, it would have an unusual material strength because it's made of stainless steel, an unusual uh, speed because it was propelled artificially. And so we decided to go to the Pacific Ocean, the, lo the location that was identified by the Department of Defense as the site of this uh, explosion, and we localized it even better using... Uh, the sound wave that was recorded from the explosion uh, by a seismometer in Papua New Guinea. Uh, and so uh, we went there uh, and uh, searched for any molten droplets from the surface of the object when it was exposed to the immense heat from the fireball. And uh, that was a very challenging task because the ocean depth is uh, more than a mile. And the region that we searched through was seven miles long. And so uh, we uh, built a sled with magnets on both sides and we dragged it on the ocean surface. Um, and uh, amazingly, we recovered some of those uh, spherules, molten, molten droplets, 700 of them all together from the region. And we brought them back to Harvard University where we used the mass spectrometer to figure out their composition. And among them, we found the molten droplets that are of composition never seen before, uh, indicating that the object most likely came from outside the solar system because this particular 
uh, spherules, droplets, were found mostly along uh, the meteor path. And altogether, it was a very challenging uh, task for us to find those uh, on the ocean floor. Uh, in life, it's good to be an optimist because sometimes life is a self-fulfilling prophecy. If we were to decide that it's hopeless, we would never search. And this is really the first time that scientists put their hands on materials from a large object that came from outside the solar system. So how big of an object was this that even came into our atmosphere? And then I guess it just broke apart as it maybe hit the ocean? How did... How do you theorize that even happened? Well, the explosion released a few percent of uh, the Hiroshima atomic bomb uh, energy. So it was quite powerful. That's how U.S. government satellites uh, detected this uh, meteor and they measured its speed uh, that allowed us to infer that it's interstellar. Um, but um, uh, the amount of uh, material that was in the object is not known. All we know is that about 500 kilograms of materials uh, participated in that explosion, but the object could have been bigger than that. And that means that the core of the object could have survived the impact and may, in fact, lie on the ocean floor. Uh, in the first expedition, we just searched for uh, those uh, tiny fragments left over the size of a grain of sand. We are planning now a, a second expedition. Now that we know uh, where the fragments were, the, the, we look at them as uh, romantically as uh, rose petals that lead us to our lover, <laughs> which is actually the object itself. And we want to find uh, big pieces because they would tell us about the nature of the object, whether it was a rock or uh, some technological gadget. Because a gadget might have uh, screws, might have uh, buttons on it. And if we find buttons, the question is whether to press a button. <laughs> so, so if it is a button or a screw, that tells us what? If we find a technological object, uh, you know, most likely it's not functional. It was uh, space trash, the way that the Voyager will be when it leaves the solar system. Uh, to exit the solar system, it would take Voyager 10,000 years. And at that point, it will not be functional anymore. And it's very possible that a lot of civilizations that preceded us polluted interstellar space with uh, non-functioning devices, uh, just like plastics in the ocean that keep accumulating over time. In this case, it's because they're bound by gravity to the Milky Way galaxy. They don't escape. They are not fast enough to escape the Milky Way. And so there should be a population of these objects if we are not alone. But in addition, you can imagine the existence of functional devices. Uh, and those would be much more interesting because you can learn about the sender. Uh, you can learn about the intent of those gadgets much more than uh, just pieces of trash that we happen to collide with. Uh, at any event, uh, even finding trash uh, in interstellar space is of great importance because it would imply that uh, there are polluters, that we are not alone, and that would have huge implications for the future of humanity because, first of all, it will be a wake-up call for us to realize that there might be a smarter kid on our block uh, that uh, we can learn from. We can uh, study whatever we find and, and realize what might lie in our technological future because they might be more advanced than we are. And second, uh, it will maybe uh, tell us that uh, in order for us to survive, uh, we better change our priorities and focus on space exploration. And my hope yes. is that it will bring us to a better place. So real quick, we're going to dive in after we take a break. But real quick, are we alone? I think it's arrogant to believe that. Uh, in fact, when I hear the the news every day, uh, um, it looks to me like we are not uh, the pinnacle of creation. Uh, we are not the most intelligent that one can imagine. Uh, and my hope <laughs> is that we will get the inspiration by finding a letter or a package near our mailbox. We would then uh, realize that we can do better. Folks, you're watching Beyond the Problems. 
I'm talking today with Dr. Avi Loeb. We'll be right back. How Not to Age, my new book coming out in December is now available for pre-order. It is my sincere hope that this book adds not just years to your life, but life to your years. As always, all proceeds I receive from the sales of all my books are donated directly to charity. Are you fun and ready for a dream vacation? Immerse yourself in the historic romance of Venice or capture the sun-soaked paradise of Santorini. Travelfun.biz makes it all attainable for less than you'd expect. Our U.S.-based trusted team of travel concierge are complimentary and take care of every detail. Work hard, play harder. Choose casual luxury. Choose Travelfun.biz to book all of your travel. A family-owned and operated agency. Your fun is our biz. Text us for... Welcome back. You're watching Beyond the Problems, talking today with Dr. Avi Loeb, an astrophysicist, a Harvard professor, talking about UFOs and the truths of potential extraterrestrial beings, interstellar things. Avi, again, thanks for joining us. My so, Avi, if you're a gambling man and your wife gave you $100 to buy food for your family, for your starving children. You go to Vegas. Would you bet that $100 that there are beings beyond this planet? Or would you maybe not bet? Which which way would you put that $100? Oh, uh, for sure. Uh, I Well, Vegas doesn't <laughs> offer me the answer necessarily. I mean, uh, um, what uh, happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. But <laughs> in the case of uh, science... Uh, you know, that happens only inside a black hole, by the way. The, what ha happens inside the horizon of a black hole stays there. Uh, I uh, would like to find the answer by collecting evidence rather than having an opinion. This is not a political matter. And, um, you know, in, in cases of science, uh, uh, the reasoning of an individual is worth more than the opinions of a thousand people. That's what Galileo Galilei said when he was put in house arrest while arguing that the earth is not at the center of the world. And of course, at the time, uh, you know, it flattered the ego of uh, theologians to suggest that we are at the center. Uh, but Galileo looked through his telescope and found the moons of uh, Jupiter moving around Jupiter, not around us. And so he asked those theologians to look to, through his uh, telescope uh, but they refused because they had an opinion. And my point is that very often uh, throughout history, we still have opinions rather than search for evidence to guide us. Uh, and the, the lesson that we should learn from the experience of Galileo is that we should always respect data and rather than the opinions of people. In fact, FIFA uh, in the Women's World Cup um, decided to use uh, video cameras to decide whether a goal uh, is real or not. They didn't go to ask those who played on the, on the field or, or the spectators. And uh, this is the scientific method, uh, which is the foundation of the Galileo project that I'm leading. So it all goes back to Galileo. Uh, we built an observatory to look at the sky and search for any technological objects that are not from this earth. Uh, and among them, of course, are those unidentified anomalous phenomena, UAP. Yeah. And why, why did we switch from UFO to UAP? That was a decision made uh, in government uh, because the uh, term uh, UFOs was tainted by a long history where uh, people talked about unsubstantiated claims. And uh, and of course, a, a lot of eyewitnesses say what they saw, uh, talk about experiences they had. But as we know from car accidents, uh, different people provide different reports uh, about the same facts, the same events. And so we cannot rely on people uh, the way we rely on scientific instruments. Uh, it's really fundamental for our scientific knowledge to be based on well-calibrated instruments that are under control even those that are in cockpits of fighter jets that military personnel use, um, you know, should not be trusted because we don't know what the jet was doing when the 
videos that we see, those fuzzy videos, uh, were taken. Uh, and so, you know, the sky is not classified. Uh, we shouldn't rely on the U.S. government in finding the answer because the day job of uh, the U.S. government is national security. It's not to find out what lies outside the solar system. That's the, the job definition of astronomers. And uh, therefore, I'm up for the task. And I'm happy uh, to compliment the U.S. government. They would like to know what says uh, uh, which objects have uh, made in China on them. Uh, and for me, those are very boring. Uh, and uh, <laughs> we complement each other. And there is no reason for us to wait for the government to tell us the answer. There was a period of time, thousands of years ago, <laughs> when potentially some religions that we now have in this world, I mean, we've had how many religions, how many gods. But if we're basing things on data, does that change our theology even? today? Definitely. And I see it as a way of uh, bringing together, actually, religion and science, because uh, I wrote an essay just recently on medium.com where I asked the question, is God an advanced scientist? And the reason I asked that is uh, because uh, if you imagine our scientific future, we might be able to create life in the laboratory in if we ever understand how to unify quantum mechanics and gravity, we might be able to produce a baby universe in the laboratory by <laughs> concentrating enough energy in a small volume. And so these are qualities that were assigned to God. And you can imagine a civilization that developed its science well beyond the point where we are, because we had just one century since the time that we discovered quantum mechanics, for example. So just imagine us continuing to discover things about reality uh, in the next uh, uh, millennium or even a million years from now. Uh, obviously, uh, it would look like magic, whatever is discovered in the distant future uh, to us now, just the way that New York City appears to a cave dweller that comes to visit. Um, it would look like a miracle. And in fact, you know, in the uh, Old Testament, the Bible, there is this story about Moses who witnessed a burning bush. Uh, and that convinced him that there is a superhuman entity called God. And if I were next to Moses, I would have used the uh, infrared cameras that we have in the Galileo Project <laughs> Observatory. And I could have measured how much heat is emitted from the burning bush. What's the surface temperature of the bush? I could have calculated whether it's indeed natural or perhaps manufactured by uh, a superhuman entity. And we could have fooled Moses with the gadgets we have right now. We could have placed it in front of Moses and he would have believed that these are all miracles. <laughs> so my point is uh, that a very advanced technology uh, would um, uh, inspire um, a sense of awe, uh, the way that religion did uh, when miracles were witnessed. And uh, therefore... If in the future we encounter a much more advanced uh, culture of scientists, uh, they might look to us uh, like God, and we could ask them fundamental questions. The, the, the first question that I would like to know the answer to is uh, what happened before the Big Bang? When our universe was created, was there a scientist in a white coat that decided to make our universe? Uh, mm. That's my first question. And of course, the other question that I would like to know the answer to is, where is the nearest party where we can meet uh, other civilizations <laughs> um, uh, and hang together? Because uh, there is a lot that we might be able to learn from them. You raise some fascinating points that I want to get into myself right after the break. Stay tuned. Are you fun and ready for a dream vacation? Immerse yourself in the historic romance of Venice or capture the sun-soaked paradise of Santorini. Travelfun.biz makes it all attainable for less than you'd expect. Our U.S.-based trusted team of travel concierge are complimentary and take care of every detail. Work hard, play harder. Choose casual luxury. Choose Travelfun.biz to book all of your travel. A family-owned and operated agency. Your fun is our biz. Texas for... Welcome back. You are watching Beyond the Problems. 
Dr. Avi Loeb, you raised a couple of interesting points that I am fascinated by. The party, where is the party where we can meet with all these other life forms? Here on Earth, we seem to, uh, we don't coexist very well. The, the lower life forms, the animals, if I dare call them lower life forms, we put them in cages. Um, if aliens are smart, are intelligent, they don't want to be put in cages. But maybe they also don't want to dominate us. That's, that's a conundrum to me. What would you make of that? Well, um, a decade ago, uh, Stephen Hawking warned that uh, we should uh, avoid sending signals that uh, might uh, bring uh, threats to us uh, from interstellar space. I don't see it that way. I think if they get to our doorstep before we get to their doorstep, they must be far more advanced than we are. And we have an opportunity to learn from them. Um, and so, in fact, I don't think they even have us in mind because uh, humans existed on Earth just for the past few million years, which is about one part in 10,000 of the age of the sun. Uh, and uh, moreover, uh, we became uh, distinguishable from nature very recently, just over the recent decades. Uh, and then, um, you know, when we came across uh, nuclear physics, when we realized uh, how to fly and so forth. And um, that is a very recent phenomena. We transmitted uh, radio waves out, uh, but those radio waves only reached a few hundred stars so far, like the sun. So perhaps nobody knows about us. The point is that any interstellar journey uh, takes millions to billions of years with the kind of technologies that we can imagine right now for propulsion. And so um, as a result, any sender would not have us in mind. They have some other objectives and we can try and figure this out. For us, it will be an inspiration to see what kind of advanced technologies they're using because it gives us a glimpse at our technological future. So I see it more as an opportunity for us to learn from them than a threat. And um, in the past, we just searched for signals, radio signals, but this is just like waiting for a phone call at home. Nobody may call you when you are listening, when you are waiting. Uh, a much better approach is to search for any letters or packages in our backyard, because even if the senders are dead, they would still be there. And uh, we haven't done that until the last decade. Uh, so that's what I'm doing right now with the Galileo Project. The concept of the Big Bang versus, I'm going to say, versus creationism. Those two things, to me, can coexist. If there, if there is some God force that decided to start the universe, it likely started with a Big Bang. Could those two things coexist to you, in your mind? Yeah, so... Um... In principle, if we were to understand how the universe started, in, uh, and currently we don't because we don't have a theory that unifies two of the pillars of modern physics, quantum mechanics and gravity. For each of them, we have a theory that describes it. In the case of gravity, it's a theory that Einstein came up with in November 1915, more than a century ago. And in the case of quantum mechanics, uh, it's a theory that a number of physicists came with about a decade after that. And um, altogether, we haven't found how to bring the two theories together. So if we use Einstein's theory to describe the universe uh, because of uh, uh, gravity uh, that dominates the evolution of the universe, when we go back in time and we see that the universe is expanding, uh, and so, uh, and in fact, the recession speed of distant sources increases with distance. So the farther they are, the faster they move away from us. So if we take their distance and divide by their speed away from us, we end up with all of them <laughs> being yeah. at the same point uh, uh, on top of us with infinite density uh, some time back, and that is the Big Bang. And Einstein's theory does not allow us to go beyond that point because the theory basically crashes. It's a singularity. It can't uh, it it felt, falls apart, and 
The reason is that it doesn't have quantum mechanics embedded in it. But uh, if we will develop a, a quantum gravity uh, uh, theory, then we could potentially figure out the conditions necessary to make a universe like our own. Uh, and it's just like understanding how life came to exist on Earth from a soup of chemicals. If you mix a soup of chemicals and do the right things, you will end up with life because that's scientifically what we believe happened. Uh, and uh, so just like in the case of life, you can imagine creating a baby universe or at least understanding how it is possible to do that. And uh, once we understand it scientifically, there is nothing to prevent us from trying to make it ourselves. And, you know, it's possible that just like having that having babies that later mature and become adults and have babies of their own generation after generation, uh, it's possible that universes pop out of previously existing universes one after the other when they give rise to scientists who understand quantum gravity. So the, the ideas of religion... Uh, you know, they were qualitative, but perhaps science can bring them to fruition in a way. Uh, you know, there, there was this sense that the universe started at some time. That was in the uh, story of Genesis. And Einstein was not happy with that. Einstein wanted the universe to exist forever. However, his equations did not admit a stable solution forever. And so he, and, and indeed we observed the universe expanding. So there was a beginning in time when everything started. So, uh, you know, the ideas of religion are not necessarily wrong. I mean, we just have to understand the implications of those ideas. And, sure. and perhaps one day we'll bring them together with science. And the math and the science are powerful, folks. We're going to take a break. Come right back after this. The Solution Society wants you. If you are a truth seeker, a free thinker, and you are driven to help humanity forward, I personally invite you to join the Solution Society. This is a group I've founded to explore and understand the real problems facing our civilization and then crystallizing real solutions. This is no small task, and the Solution Society needs the greatest minds to participate. The Solution Society can create America 2.0, maybe even Planet Earth 2.0. We're not looking for awards or accolades. We're here for results, less suffering, and a better life for all. If this resonates with you, please go to beyondtheproblems.com and use the contact form to introduce yourself and tell us your story and your motivations. Again, the website is beyondtheproblems.com. That's beyondtheproblems.com. So Avi, again, thanks for being here. Some of this subject matter is fascinating, mind-boggling, but the, it makes sense. I'm a math guy. I'm not a scientist, but I'm a math guy. And you got to go where the math takes you or where do you go? So, but there are some things like if we understood the, the beginnings of the universe and we could create, as you had alluded to, a, another universe, maybe a baby universe, there's something that does seem to connect to us, like every single one of us. And that's love. And it, Sounds corny, but how to, as a scientist, how would we quantify love? How do we prove that? We know it exists, but how do we prove it? Well, I would uh, actually be very interesting, interested to make uh, a map of the distribution of love in the universe because um, for a simple reason, uh, the uh, Nobel laureate physicist Steven Weinberg uh, wrote at the end of his book, the first three minutes, that the more we comprehend the universe, uh, the more pointless it looks. And uh, the way uh, I understand it is that uh, my colleagues who study the universe, they focus on lifeless entities. 
These are elementary particles, radiation, stars, galaxies, dark matter. Uh, they have no light. And um, as a result, uh, it feels lonely. It feels pointless. What's the point about having the Big Bang, creating all these galaxies and stars? There is no point. You know, we are just a byproduct of some evolution from initial conditions. But um, one thing I learned through my personal life is that um, by finding a partner, I uh, discover the meaning to my existence, okay? And so if we do find a, a partner, a neighbor, with uh, whom we can uh, converse and learn from, uh, it will give a meaning to our cosmic existence. And I think that's what cosmologists are missing right now. That's why the universe appears to be pointless. And coming back to your question, it all... Uh, centers on the connection, the, the love uh, as a connection between intelligent beings uh, will uh, bring us uh, to a better future because we are all in the same boat uh, right now on Earth, sailing through space. And, you know, when I was on the boat in the Pacific Ocean looking for the fragments of the first interstellar meteor, uh, I saw the team members uh, working together, collaborating uh, for the success of the mission. And it was a very good metaphor for humanity. Uh, unfortunately, we are engaged uh, in a lot of wasted uh, conflicts. Um, uh, for example, there are two wars right now uh, taking place, and uh, we invest $2 trillion every year uh, in military budgets worldwide. Uh, if we were just to listen to the words of John Lennon, imagine all the people living in peace. Uh, we, could, we would have a surplus of $2 trillion every year. And I calculated that we could send a CubeSat towards every star in the Milky Way galaxy, billions of them, <laughs> within this century. If we just change priorities, if we let love uh, dominate over hate. Um, and the, the question is, why is the reality that we live in so different? Uh, and it may well be that we uh, came from uh, the animal world where resources were limited, where we were engaged in zero-sum games. But what science brings to the table is uh, abundance. Uh, uh, we are now not uh, limited by zero-sum games because we can go to space. So the real estate that we find here on Earth is, is not uh, limited uh, uh, to just what we find on this Earth. We can find many more habitable planets and uh, ex, you know send the uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, astronauts to space that will replicate what we find here on earth and um so um, all together you know the science is an infinite sum game where knowledge that the one person gains uh, serves everyone and so that's a much better uh, future for us for humanity to um, invest in than uh, the zero-sum games of territorial disputes here on Earth. Uh, we haven't gotten the message, uh, and uh, Not <laughs> uh, my, my hope is that uh, by receiving a letter from an, a neighbor, uh, we will uh, get a wake-up wake call that will bring us to that uh, kind of a more peaceful future. As a kid, and you talk about physics, I don't think of love and connection. It just, those don't connect. But it fascinates me that you do delve into that. You came to physics almost maybe from a theological side of things, a meaning of life side of thing. I, um, we're going to take a break, but I'm going to want to talk a little bit about that, about you, how you come to physics and what drives you. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. How Not to Age, my new book coming out in December, is now available for pre-order. It is my sincere hope that this book adds not just years to your life, but life to your years. As always, all proceeds I receive from the sales of all my books are donated directly to charity.
Are you fun and ready for a dream vacation? Immerse yourself in the historic romance of Venice or capture the sun-soaked paradise of Santorini. Travelfun.biz makes it all attainable for less than you'd expect. Our U.S.-based trusted team of travel concierge are complimentary and take care of every detail. Work hard, play harder. Choose casual luxury. Choose Travelfun.biz to book all of your travel, a family-owned and operated agency. Your fun is our biz. Text us for a quote on your dream vacation today. Welcome back. You're watching Beyond the Problems. I'm Jeff Popik talking tonight with Dr. Avi Loeb, an astrophysicist. Avi, what brings you to the world of physics? I grew up on a farm uh, in Israel, and uh, uh, as a kid, I used to be uh, fascinated by philosophical questions, that the, the most fundamental questions. Um, and uh, I never imagined that I would become a scientist. Um, but um, because of the obligatory service in the military, I chose to pursue physics and mathematics that, uh, in a program uh, that allowed me to finish my PhD at age 24, uh, because that was the closest I could get to um, uh, philosophical thinking. And then uh, I was offered a position at uh, Princeton, and after that, uh, I became a tenured professor at Harvard University, at which point I realized, you know, I'm, even though it was an arranged marriage, I'm actually married to my true love because using the tools of science, I can address philosophical questions like, uh, where did we come from? Uh, uh, what was there at the beginning? Uh, are we alone? And what can we learn from uh, uh, intelligence elsewhere? Uh, and then, uh, Altogether, I feel that now at the, the late uh, phase of my career, uh, you know, I, I actually fulfill the uh, promise of uh, that I gave to myself at a young age. Uh, and, um, you know, it's really a very fascinating time because not only we can figure out if there are any packages in our backyard that came from other civilizations, we actually created uh, a, a, an alien intelligence uh, which is artificial intelligence. You know, it's made of uh, silicon chips, not from flesh and blood. And uh, it could give us a sense of what it's like uh, for us to interact with another intelligence that is uh, quite different than we are. Could we, if, th if there is a civilization somewhere out in the universe or the multiverse, however it goes, are we able to communicate with them or are they so far beyond us that we're disconnected? Well, my, my expectation is that we will not be visited by biological creatures because the journey is very long and uh, there are lots of risks in space from uh, energetic particles, cosmic rays. Um, and so it, it makes much more sense to send the uh, technological gadgets, uh, with uh, their own brain, uh, artificial intelligence. We haven't uh, sent artificial intelligence to space as of yet. We sent uh, robots uh, like the Perseverance rover uh, that is uh, uh, managed by engineers uh, in Pasadena, uh, Jet Propulsion Lab. Uh, I call that helicopter parenting. Uh, in fact, we are parenting <laughs> a helicopter on Mars as well, the ingenuity. Uh, but... Um, uh, the next step would be to send the uh, autonomous probes that uh, decide for themselves uh, what to do uh, with their own brain, artificial intelligence, and they would just report back to us the way that our kids report back to us when they go into the world. I mean, they don't give us all the information, just the one that is important, uh, and uh, they make decisions on their own. Uh, and so that is necessary when you travel through interstellar space because even light takes thousands of years to traverse the distances between stars in the Milky Way galaxy. So uh, you cannot imagine the probe waiting for guidance. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, uh, it would be the challenge of our own AI systems to figure out uh, the intent of extraterrestrial AI systems. They might feel kinship to those extraterrestrials more than to us. Uh, and uh, uh, it would be just fascinating to watch our own AI systems trying to figure out, to decode uh, either the language or the intent of any probes that visit us. Uh, it's just like the imitation game uh, that uh, Alan Turing imagined 
um, uh, last century where he thought about AI systems imitating humans. Uh, but the, what I'm thinking about is our AI systems imitating extraterrestrial AI systems, trying to figure them out. And um, of course, they will let later explain to us what they are finding. Um, so um, we will just watch them with awe, I think. And that, that is something for the next century. So the biological aliens that people talk about, do you think they're real? Or do you think that's just a lot of hoax stuff? Well, uh, <laughs> they might very well exist out there, but I find it hard to believe that they will uh, board a, a spaceship that takes uh, millions to billions of years to reach us. Um, and, um, you know, if we find whatever they send, those technological probes, uh, it will resemble the allegory of the cave of Plato where prisoners are sitting in a cave looking forward and they are seeing the shadows uh, cast on the walls of the cave from a fire that was lit behind them. And they're trying to figure out what is behind them just by looking at the shadows in front of them. So we would see those technological gadgets visiting us. We'll try to figure out the nature of the senders, just like the shadows uh, showing us a partial view of whoever made those shadows in uh, Plato's uh, uh, cave allegory. And um, so, it, of course, it's not a substitute for actually meeting those senders, but to meet them, we will have to board the spaceship. And uh, that will be a very long journey to go to other places. <laughs> and they may not be alive anymore, you know, by the time we get there. So um, for now, we will have, I mean, if we find any functioning devices, we will have to deal with those. And uh, perhaps one day we will visit our neighbors, but that will take a while. Yeah, it's fascinating. For me, again, I, I probably say this too much, but being a math guy, the enormity of the universe, it's almost hard to imagine that we are alone, like this vast place, and we're the only ones inhabiting this this multiverse yeah but uh, well another uh, implication of the vast uh, uh, size of even the milky way galaxy relative to the solar system you know um, is that um, we shouldn't conclude what lies uh, outside the solar system by knowing what happens inside the solar system you know elon musk for example made statements he said i'm the space guy i know what's out there in space but what he really knows is what happens around the orbit of the Earth near the Sun. And uh, that is uh, one part in 10 to the 15 of the size of the universe. Uh, uh, the size of the universe is a quadrillion times bigger than the Earth-Sun separation. And uh, it's roughly the ratio between the head of a pin and the distance to the farthest planet within the solar system. So just imagine an ant uh, making a statement about the farthest planet in the solar system based on a survey <laughs> of the head of a pin. Um, it's irresponsible. That will be a very presumptuous ant. Uh, that's my reply to Elon, who argued that he doesn't know of any aliens. Uh, you know, the, the whole point, is, I mean, people make the claim that uh, extraordinary uh, claims require extraordinary evidence. And the point is they're not seeking the evidence. And so my point is extraordinary evidence requires extraordinary funding. You need to engage in the search. Otherwise, the evidence doesn't fall into your lap. We know that from physics, uh, we wouldn't find gravitational waves unless we invested more than a billion dollars in building the LIGO observatory over decades. And so we really need to look through our windows before we say anything about our neighbors. Ed? The math and the science actually make things more and more fascinating the deeper we get into the data. Folks, we're going to take a break and come right back. Stay tuned. How Not to Age, my new book coming out in December, is now available for pre-order. It is my sincere hope that this book adds not just years to your life, but 
life to your years. As always, all proceeds I receive from the sales of all my books are donated directly to charity. Are you fun and ready for a dream vacation? Immerse yourself in the historic romance of Venice or capture the sun-soaked paradise of Santorini. Travelfun.biz makes it all attainable for less than you'd expect. Our U.S.-based trusted team of travel concierge are complimentary and take care of every detail. Work hard, play harder. Choose casual luxury. Choose Travelfun.biz to book all of your travel. A family-owned and operated agency. Your fun is our biz. Text us for a quote on your dream vacation today. Welcome back. You're watching Beyond the Problems, talking tonight with Dr. Avi Loeb about a fascinating subject uh, with extraterrestrial and interstellar things. Um, doctor, what problems can we solve today based on the research and the findings that you're dealing in? You know, say six months ago, prior to your latest findings, what do we now know today that we didn't know then? Well, we know that there are uh, interstellar objects that look uh, unusual. Uh, and the, the first two of them over the past decade didn't look like the rocks that we are familiar with in the solar system. The question is, what does it mean? And until we find a piece of the uh, uh, such an interstellar object and examine it carefully, we will not be able to tell um, whether it's uh, a natural or artificial in origin. And so that is what uh, I plan uh, to search for in the coming year, um, uh, going again to the Pacific Ocean, finding per uh, perhaps a bigger piece of this meteor uh, and deciding whether it was a rock or something else. Uh, as of now, uh, we don't have that piece, so I cannot say anything. But once we <laughs> find materials um, uh, or information about interstellar objects that uh, behave as if they were made by another technological civilization, you know, we could uh, obviously import those technologies to Earth. And it would make a lot of sense to invest uh, in a business uh, that um, takes advantage of those because, you know, we could potentially find something like iPhone 100 or chat GPT 20, <laughs> um, things that uh, will take us a while to develop ourselves. And therefore, um, the best is just to uh, continue the search uh, and, you know, take advantage of whatever we find. And uh, that's what I promise to continue to do in the coming years. So famine, war that we're on the cusp of right now, um, how do we solve some of these based on what you know? Well, um, I think um, we should be inspired by the prospects to survive much longer than uh, our history would suggest because, um, you know, we were very close to a nuclear war uh, with the Soviets. Uh, we might be uh, close to it right now as a result of the two wars that are taking place. Um, and, uh, so, you know, we should uh, uh, realize that uh, we are playing with fire here, that the f our future may be at risk. Uh, we have some serious existential risks, not just in the context of pandemics or artificial intelligence, but in the context of territorial disputes. And uh, it's about time that um, we would uh, change our priorities. I think uh, the most intelligent thing to do is focus on collaboration in the context of science and technology. Uh, uh, you know, we have a surplus in uh, wealthy countries that could be shared with uh, poorer countries uh, rather than engaging conflicts. And, you know, part of the problem is that uh, very often uh, People prefer to feel uh, a sense of superiority relative to other people. We should uh, uh, abandon that. And um, all together, you know, we are here on this planet. Let's work together towards a more prosperous future. Let's invest in science, in work, in collaborations that are international rather than in uh, concerns how to kill each other or occupy territories or, um, you know, get the an advantage relative to others.
Um, that is my advice. That seems to me like the most intelligent thing for us to do for the long-term survival. And, you know, the solutions will come uh, forward uh, once we work together. I I'm very um, confident that the human spirit will allow us to survive long as long as we work together and we realize that, you know, that, we are all um, equal members of the human species. We have maybe about a minute left, so I want to thank you for coming on. But real quick, why do we forget the love? Why do we forget the collaboration, as you said? Why do we forget the, the um, camaraderie? How does that get lost? <laughs> Can you sum that up? Yeah, well, I asked the same question in a play that was written uh, for uh, to be presented at New York, in New York City next year. And the question is, why is childlike bullying uh, more prevalent than childlike curiosity? And uh, my understanding is that because that were, was um, our history, you know, we came from the animal kingdom where resources were limited, zero-sum games. We need to realize that now we are facing a completely different future where abundance is provided by technology and science. So we should be much more hopeful. Uh, the message is uplifting. We just didn't hear it yet. Yeah, I think those are fantastic words. Again, thank you so much for coming on. And when your play launches, we'll have to get you back to talk about that some more. Folks, you're watching Beyond the Problems. I'm Jeff Popik. I think the takeaway here is we have to start to turn our back on the divisiveness and start to collaborate and start to come together and start to get connected with each and every one of us. We're all in this together. We're all on the same planet. Let's get it together. Until next time, thanks for watching. <laughs>